All right, it's four o'clock, so we should start. Um, let's start by uh, having the folks um, from the committee who are here introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Kirsten Work for anybody who doesn't know me, which might be just a person or two perhaps. Um, and I'm the chair of the committee this semester, but I'm new, so <laughs> hopefully you guys can be patient with me. Um, so next, Barb, do you wanna introduce yourself? We can't hear you, Barb. You're muted, I think. Yeah. There we go. There, go. there we go. Barbara Costello, library faculty. Uh, Jesse? Hi, everyone. Jesse Fox in the uh, Counselor Education Department. Kelly? Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Smith. I'm an assistant professor in the Political Science Department, and this will be my second uh, year on this committee. Sean? Hi, I'm Sean Kennard. I'm from the School of Music. Johan? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Sorry, I just came back. Uh, Hi, my name is Johan Rupert, and this is also my second year on the PDC committee, and I'm happy to answer any question you might have. And then we have Chris, who is the uh, mastermind behind all of the logistics. I'm here. Carolyn. Oh, Carolyn. Sorry, <laughs> I was I was looking at the the sunglasses. It's okay. I got I got here a little bit. I got here a little bit late. Sorry. Um, I'm Carolyn Nicholson. I'm a professor in the uh, uh, marketing department over in the school of business. Okay, great. So um, I have gathered from the other members of the committee that a lot of the time is going to be spent um, just asking questions. But I did, for anybody new who hasn't been through this process before, I did want to share a quick PowerPoint that um, goes through the process. So um, these are the sort of general guidelines for, for doing one of these, um, either a, a summer grant or a sabbatical. So hopefully you guys can see all this. I have my, there we go. Um, so I, I made this sort of a um, timeline kind of pro for the process. So this, this piece here is only for people who are, are gonna be um, applying for sabbatical. So they need to announce their, um, intention to apply for sabbatical by the 28th. So I have the procedure and I have the dates here. Um, people who are chair, I don't know how many people that uh, applies to in the, in the room, so to speak. Um, but if people are department chairs then they have to designate a, re a, a reviewer and those are the dates for the time when you have to have that done. So it's coming up pretty quick. But for, every, for all of these, obviously the, the applicant is going to write a proposal for a broad audience, which we'll talk about in a second. And here are the due dates in early October for when that is due. And the, app, the uh, links for um, the applications are now live. We just got them live today. So um, you're going to write the proposal and submit it by either the 4th if you're doing a summer grant or the 11th if you're doing a sabbatical. Then that proposal um, is going to go to the designee or the chair um, to, you know, if you were a chair, your designee, to write an evaluation letter, and that is due on the 11th for a summer grant and for on the 18th for a sabbatical. That letter is going to go, um, or that proposal is also going to the dean. The dean also writes a letter, and then um, the PDC evaluates all of this and um, forwards the recommendation for um, which proposals get funded um, on the uh, 16th or the 26th, depending on whether it's a summer grant or a sabbatical. And then the provost has the final say and um, will make that final say on December 1st for a summer grant and December 10th for a sabbatical. And for just for sabbaticals, the associate, at least that's how it reads in the, in the um, guidelines, the associate provost evaluates the sabbaticals, but not the summer grants apparently. So um, one thing we wanted to talk about just a little bit, and members of the committee, feel free to ch chime in at any point, um, were some guidelines that might help you write a successful proposal. 
And so um, first and foremost, you wanna write for a general audience. And I just solicited, um, and hopefully it will be posted soon, an example from science. I hope to get some more, but of something written for an, an article, a journal article versus how you might write it for a proposal like this. Because I'm from biology, Barb's from the library, um, Sean's from music and so on and so forth. So um, you wanna make sure that you write it in such a way that all of us can understand it. I mean, we're all smart people, yes, but we don't all know the jargon. So you need to be um, translating that into um, a form that can be writ read by somebody from any discipline. And there have been proposals that have been denied on that basis. So first is writing for a general audience. Second, um, you need to outline how this project advances your research or your creative expression. So you wanna give enough detail so that we understand what the project is and what the goals are and what you're doing. Um, but you also need to make a case for this. It's, it's, it's not that different from, from writing a tenure and promotion type deal where you're we you have to make a case for getting tenure you have to make a case for getting promotion you have to make a case for getting a proposal as well or getting a, a grant as well um and then an, another thing that would be helpful is if you provide a tangible expected outcome um it doesn't necessarily have to be a published paper that may not be the end but whatever your tangible published or your tangible outcome is it would be good to um explain that. And if you had a timeline even better, so we could see sort of that you've got in your mind what you're going to do and that it's doable in the amount of time that you have in the summer and that there is an outcome at the end. And then finally, um, there is some extra money that beyond the summer grants that um, can be applied for, for or that you can make a case for in your application um, above and beyond what you would get for the summer grant, so for extra expenditures. Um, but again, you have to make the case for it because sometimes it might not be obvious to the committee what this is for. So um, if you make a good connection, then, then we'll understand. Does anybody have any questions about that? Any of that? Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So uh, there's an award attached to this. Uh, do we have to have expenditures? So like if I wanted to propose, for example, that I want to, so I'm a music theorist, if, if but a lot of my time is spent just analyzing things, I can just download a lot of the music because it's in the public domain. I don't need to travel anywhere or do anything. Can I still apply for the- oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you can use the award as a stipend. Okay, yeah. that, that mm -hmm. was my question, thank you. Yep. Yeah, um, and I had some, we've had some questions about um, what some of these ex expenditures could and could not be. So I found, that I, actually Rosalie um, sent me to the FAQ page, I think this is where I got it, or maybe it was in the document itself, um, that includes some examples of things that are, are appropriate expenditures and some that are not. So um, research travel can be, in, um, you can use the money for research travel, which could include a conference if it's in that period. Um, you can use it for materials and supplies and equipment and um, other expenses that are related to the grants that are in the period of the summer grant. But things that you can't use it for, you can't use it to pay other students, other faculty, uh, staff um, as research assistants. You can't use it for publication costs uh, uh, or page costs like other publications costs. And you can't use it for, like if you do the project in the summer and then you wanna present that project, but it's not until December, you can't use the summer grant money for that. I'm sure there's lots of other questions about things that people might ask, um, but that's sort of like broadly some guidelines. Um, when you submit it, there, like I said, the, the two websites are live. Um, it's green on the top on yours, but um, when I look at it, I have this, this page which shows the questions and then um, the responses will be there. And so I'll have all of the documents um, attached there. So um, like I said, they're already alive. So if you go to the provost, uh, the, the, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you exactly where it is because it's kind of hard to find. You can always Google summer, Stetson Summer Grant or Stetson Sabbatical and get there, but I can show you, I'll, I'll navigate there and show you what it looks like um, too, if you want to get there through the website. At any rate, this is more or less what they look like and you just fill in the information and upload the documents. We've all done this before. So, um, and then the, 
the role, our role, besides doing these um, information sessions, is to evaluate the proposals. And we are explicitly expected to evaluate the merit of the proposals. And these rubrics are on the information packets that are posted um, on the website, Let, like I'll show you in a second. Um, and um, so we're evaluating the scholarly value, the scope of the project, the value of the, to the university or the impact on the person's professional growth and the qualifi qualifications and quality. So, and then for the summer grant, because it's, it's a shorter period of time, can it be finished in that um, amount of time? And did they submit a previous um, summer grant, the results from a previous summer grant. So these are the ways that we're evaluating these proposals. So you wanna do a good job when you write one because we are going to be evaluating it. And you know, hopefully everybody gets one, but I, I can't, can't guarantee that. So um, be sure to, and uh, Carolyn made a really good point that um, a way to make it very clear is to, to have this rubric next to you while you're finishing your, your summer, or even while you're starting your summer grant, because you might write it with even perhaps even with these headings so that it's very clear to the committee how your your proposal is fulfilling these areas okay so um the only other thing i was going to do was i was going to show you um stop share that show you because it was i it was not obvious to me okay so you get on the um, Provost uh, Academic Affairs website. I thought it was gonna be under faculty resources because to me it was faculty resources. It's not, it's under policies and guidelines. And if you go down, then you can see sabbatical leaves. And so there's the information packet, there's the application. Um, so that's, that's the link that takes you to what I just showed you a minute, a minute ago. And then there's a sabbatical leave reporting guide. And then down here, there's the summer grants link and it takes you to the summer grant and it's the same thing. You get that information packet and the application, which is live. So that was all I had to present. So um, questions for the committee? Yes. I have another question. I'm just looking at the application thing. I said something about if you're the chair of the department. I don't know if I'm the chair of my department. I'm the interim director for music theory, but it's the school of music. And I don't know if that's considered a chair or should I just say no? I think so, it's Andrew Larson for us. It, um, okay. He counts as the chair, so that wouldn't apply to you. Thanks, Sean. I thought that might be the case, but I thought I'd ask anyway. Other questions? There's like Rachel has a question. Questions. Yeah. Um, so um, a number of us who normally do research overseas obviously have our research seriously disrupted by the pandemic, i.e. our ability to go to um, China is limited, or I know in the case of some, some colleagues who need to go to archives in, oh, Mexico City, um, or something like that, um, that, that we are not, at this point, we have no idea whether we are going to be able to go overseas at this point in a global pandemic. Um, how should we write our proposal? Should we, you know, do a, ideally, I will be doing this, um, however, this is my plan B if I'm still not able to go overseas. What, what would you recommend? Looks like Kelly has a suggestion. Yeah, we had the same situation uh, last year on the committee and we found it um, most helpful if the applicant told us what the plan B was in detail. So it was really, we had a, I don't remember which application it was, but then it had an additional paragraph saying, if I'm unable to travel, this is what I'm gonna be doing during the grant period. This is how I will adjust. So knowing that you have that plan and detailing it out was really helpful for us because some of um, some other applications we were like, well, what happens if they can't travel? So putting that in there just answers our questions you know, beforehand. At least that how, that's how I felt last year. If I don't know if any of the other committee members feel differently. Sounds like a good plan to me.
Kirsten? Yes. This is maybe really a question for Barbara. Um, is it still true that the library is hosting um, proposals and or reports from previous years um, for both summer grants and sabbaticals? Um, I know that in the past, some people have found those useful to consult in putting together their own proposals. Are you muted? Okay. I'd have to check on that, Tom, and get back to you because I'm not sure um, how complete our collection is and how it's accessible. So let me check on that and I'll, I'll text you, I think, email you. I think okay. usually there has been an announcement coming out um, from the library saying, here's a, because access has always been kind of funky. Mm -hmm. and, um, so a, a sort of link to where people could find things. I can answer this question. Hey, that'd be great. I'm not sure that is. <laughs> uh, uh, because I uh, already asked uh, Sue Ryan about it. Uh, and um, it, it's a shared folder on OneDrive, uh, but the access need to be uh, requested. So not everyone has access to uh, the folder is called uh, faculty connected, something like that, but um, it's not uh, shared by default. I had to ask for permission to be shared. That was Hala, right? Yes. Okay. You're a number sign, but I recognize your voice. <laughs> okay. Um, Michael? Yeah, so I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, I just want to make sure that they are okay about uh, what I'm proposing. So I'm um, applying for sabbatical in spring 2023. And in the proposal, I talked about some preliminary data collection that I'll plan to do in fall 2022. Is it okay to kind of get started early to, to make sure or to propose that I'm going to make sure that things are working before the sabbatical actually begins? Is that, is that okay? I don't know what other people think, but I think that sounds great. It sounds great to me. I mean, you know, research is a continuous process, and I don't think anybody expects that a sabbatical will have a hard start and hard finish. Got it. Okay. And then the second one is the project is a massive data collection project. And so I'm going to um, propose to have 10 uh, students working for me voluntarily. Um, and so I just want to make sure that that's okay too. It's not like expected that the work falls like entirely on you, that it's okay to have students working with you. As far as I know, does anybody else on the committee have another idea? I believe um, one part of the um, application is talking about how you're going to engage students if it's applicable. So you can mention that there, but I, I agree. I don't see why that's a, a problem, but you'd probably address it there. I think it's in the fourth part or something like that. Okay, I'll check that part out. Thanks. Other questions? To start calling on people? Holly, you have any questions? <laughs> I think I'm good for now. Okay. <laughs> I might have more later. I don't know. Thank you. Well, I might as well ask this one. Um, so I, I finished my uh, proposal and had some people read it and I got one potential criticism from someone uh, and I, I checked with some other people and it doesn't seem to actually be a problem, but might as well check with all of you too. Um, so there's not a specific research question in what I'm proposing. It's more of a, a project where I'm creating a specific uh, outcome. I'm developing a, a large eye tracking data corpus. Um, so there's no like specific question that I'm after. Uh, there's a, a reason that this thing needs to be developed that I explain in the proposal. Uh, but the lack of a specific research question was something one person uh, pointed out that might be a problem. Does that appear to be a problem for you at all? By your description, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. I mean, scholarly output 
you know, includes such a wide variety of things, um, development of, of something like that, that would be beneficial not only to you, but to um, colleagues in the field is a, a valuable endeavor. It'd probably be helpful to know, right, like you mentioned, why it's needed, and then maybe how it could be used in research in the future, those two things. Yeah, um, who would use it, right? Yeah, who would use it, how, why, how is it a contribution, right, to the field would be helpful. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, one, of, one of the things you might outline in your proposal is sort of the importance to the discipline, mm -hmm. and it sounds like what you're proposing would be important to the discipline, so you could, you could stress that. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Actually, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so I'm between uh, uh, two ideas. One is kind of a continuation to the research I'm good at. <laughs> and another is way too new to me. It just, you know, I wanted to do it for a long time, but I never had the chance. So it's, it's, uh, um, I don't have a lot of background about it. it's going to take more learning and so forth. Which one is, is one preferable uh, over the other? Or, I mean, uh, because I think part of the application is to demonstrate that you can do it. Uh, but uh, like I, I have research expertise that maybe <laughs> is the kind of the documentation, but it's going to be in a new area of research for me. So should I start something new or should I keep doing what I'm doing? <laughs> Johan's nodding. He looks like he has something to say. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I think we had a similar case last year, and uh, we thought that we also ought to encourage new direction and new projects. So I would say, uh, per what happened uh, as, as a precedent, we would not want you to not submit a, new, uh, a research for a new project because, you know, uh, it's new after all that they would kind of be uh, self-deserving, self but usually new projects have always some sort of semi-precedent in the form of a course or a book review publication or whatever that is, something that the, the, the summer grant itself is not going to be the absolute beginning of it all. They, they, uh, it would help us to know that even though if it's a new project, it has some basis, some connection, uh, something that can, I don't want to say would reassure us, but will show the community that uh, you're not starting out of absolutely nowhere. So I, I'm not sure if I'm expressing myself quite clearly. I understand. Thank you. Yes. But it's for sabbatical. Does it make a difference? Uh, no, it, it doesn't make much of a difference. In fact, it might be a little bit easier because you have more time to carry on the product than just the summer. So uh, the, I guess the newness of the project will be matched by the length and the methodology and the plan, the, the, the research plan that you will have in six months or a year that certainly makes it more possible. And I guess it would be helpful for us to know what makes it possible in six months or a year, uh, which is certainly more possible than in the 16 weeks of the summer. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with Johan. Um, I'm new to the evaluation process, but um, you know, here at Stetson, we, we want people to continue to grow as, as faculty, right? And, and to expand their expertise. So I would say that doing a new project is great. It gives you, like you said, the opportunity that you haven't had before. Um, what I would do if I were you is make sure that you um, communicate in the qualification section that you, you do have enough background to, to engage in that learning to get to the goal that you want to get to in the amount of time that you want to get to. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Rachel, you had another question? Sure. Um, I guess I already asked this of Kirsten um, over email and she gave a really helpful response, but I thought I would 
um, ask a version of this question um, to the wider committee just in case um, they've done the evaluation before. So I am a brand new chair um, and want to be um, want to make sure that I am providing the best support level or support letter possible um, for my new colleagues and for my colleagues in general. Um, as, as Kirsten said at um, sort of the chair training session, I want to I want to be setting up a supportive culture of development um, within my department. Um, and so as I start to develop my chair support letters for my colleagues, um, I was thinking about what are the parts that I want to have in there. Um, I don't think that any sort of formal document exists for chairs who are providing support, um, but Kirsten had suggested talking about the strength of the project viability and my colleagues' qualifications to conduct this research. Are there other things um, that the committee would like to see in my chair's letter? I have something to say, Kelly, too. So we have several people. Go ahead. Go ahead, yep. Carolyn. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say um, providing specifics is a good thing, as opposed to those broad general statements says, you know, a really smart person can do lots of things or whatever. Those sort of um, broad brushstrokes are, are not as useful as details. Um, and I find those, um, there's quite a lot of difference from one letter to the next, but that's what I like when I read them. I find the most helpful um, chairs letters are ones that tell us like how it's important to the discipline and why or why it's important for their personal development because again remember we're on all different disciplines so that's why it's important to write the um, application in not using jargon right with specificity but not using jargon so we can understand it and so we can only get a sense from the application of the applicant telling us why is this important to the field? Why is this significant? And so the chair's letter for me always helps me see, oh, this is why, this is where it fits in the field. This is why it's important. And those those are always the most helpful to me personally when I'm reading okay. it. What I think I hear you saying is that it's my job to contextualize my colleagues' research for a wider audience. And, and also, I, I don't mean to, I feel bad now, I don't mean to, uh, you know, uh, everyone, everybody in the committee probably wants something different also, and you cannot please everyone. But yes, what you just said, Rachel, contextualize for me, I always found it helpful in the letters to find out uh, from the chair whether that person, I mean, in broad line, whether the person can actually do it, that the, the chair knows the candidate more than all of us, I mean, in most cases, more than all of us. And if, if, of course, the, the, the proposal say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Sometimes we're like, whoa, that, that, that's a lot. And you're right, based on the discipline, you know, I mean, uh, writing two articles in the sciences is vastly different from writing even one article in the humanities and social sciences. And so to be told, uh, I have worked with that person, I have seen that person at work, I know that person's uh, research context, discipline-wise and so forth. Yes, that person can do it. Uh, that that always has helped me because there is what is in the the, the packet itself from the the applicant the candidate and then uh, whether not to be bad but whether it is actually yeah true. my my first chair at Stetson um, used to say to us when we applied for a professional grant she's like don't promise the moon don't over promise um, and so I've already had a couple of conversations with my my new tenure track faculty member. Um, about the process. Um, and hopefully I will be seeing um, a copy of her grant proposal at least a week in advance so I can so I can provide feedback on it because I intend to do so. Okay, excuse me if I pronounce your name wrong because I don't know that I've, we've met. Um, Denke? Yeah, Denke. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question about the project scope. So uh, I have done a few summer research projects in the past year, and I'm planning to apply sabbatical leave in spring uh, 2023. Uh, so um, I see the criteria on the sabbatical proposal is similar to the criteria um, used for summer grant proposals. So um, I was wondering, is there any difference on the um, project scope 
Uh, and is there anything I need to be aware of when I'm preparing uh, the proposal for the spatical need? Thank you. I would definitely say the scope should be bigger for a sabbatical um, proposal. Maybe the other people on the committee could give a, a better answer than that, having seen many of them. Yes, the scope should be um, larger. And what's helpful um, with that is, is having a timeline in the grant proposal. So you can tell us, you know, it, it doesn't have to be obviously by day, but you know, by in the fall or, you know, from May to June, I'm gonna be doing X from the proposal. That timeline's helpful. And so the timeline we would expect for a sabbatical to be much larger because we would expect you to be able to accomplish more than eight weeks in the summer, at least from our, our reading in the past. Okay. Go on. Yeah, uh, related to, to the scope, of the project and because it is also uh, a much longer time frame uh, it is also in, I, I always find it helpful to see the the bigger conceptualization for a sabbatical i mean it seems that for a sabbatical there is either taking an existing project onto a different level like a set of articles into a book i mean i'm sorry i'm speaking in the humanities and social sciences or this is where perhaps a new project arises which usually for, I mean, there is so much you can do in a summer grant. Uh, the, the sabbatical project is, again, either the beginning of a new thing. So the scope, it, it always has helped me to figure, oh, this is really a new direction, or that takes it to a complete different level, even if it is in the same project, something that cannot be done in the summer grant. OK, thank you. I would, I would think probably the outcome would be a little bit bigger, too. So, you know, at the at, at the end of a summer grant, you may or may not be submitting a paper, you might have a different, a different goal, you know, in my field anyway. Um, but at the end of a sabbatical, certainly you would be submitting a paper, I would think, because you would have done enough that you would have enough research for a, for a paper by the end of that, or be well on the way, way for one. So I would think that it in that scope, you would also have sort of amplified the end product, I would think. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And I know um, someone else already asked us, so I, I really would appreciate that if we can have access to the previous examples. Um, and because those are successful proposals really help for us to put our proposal together. Yeah, I think Barbara was going to check on that, right? Yes, and I did. Um, what you would need to do is email the dean of the library, Sue Ryan, S R Y A N at stetson.edu. And she will give you access to the files with the with the previous year's proposals. Okay. Like yeah, that? I would. Do. Yeah, I would. Do. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Everybody totally knows what they're doing. <laughs> I expect it to be uh, peppered with a lot more, uh, <laughs> a lot more uh, questions than I was. You may yet be before the deadline. Yeah. <laughs> And actually, hi, I'm, I'm uh, Nicole. I'm new faculty in, in uh, sociology and Africana studies. I, uh, how long will you all be available for questions? Because I think that's an excellent point is right now we're dealing with the beginning of the semester and all of the, as new faculty, definitely all of the interestingness. But I know as I get in a week or so, I will have all kinds, I imagine having all kinds of wonderful, interesting questions. So to when, uh, is there like a time that you have like, okay, I need to, you to reach out to me within the next week or, you know, so, sorry. <laughs> so um, 
there's there's another one of these on the 22nd at seven to catch anybody who has class at 4 p.m. on Friday or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but also you can always send questions to pdc at stetson.edu and I'm going to make a point of checking it regularly and I can, I, if, if it's something that I can't field, I'll ask the committee for their input. So you can ask me questions up until you turn it in. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you. Kristen, I have a question. Um, so how does the committee um, factor in the possibility of also applying for a Fulbright and integrating a Fulbright into a, um, into a sabbatical leave? Johan's nodding. Conflict of interest or anything like that? Did you, did you have a point to make, Johan? No, I, I, I only remember uh, a couple of occasions uh, of people like Eric and Mayhill already having uh, received the full and therefore having done it. So I know we have done it before. I, on the top of my head, I forgot exactly how they did it. Uh, I think it didn't change really much the outcome that was more of convincing us that that is why they needed a one year as opposed to a six month sabbatical. That is what I remember. And, how that would work in that case. But uh, I understand that the predicament may be that you may not know about, about that when you submit the application. Is that what you mean? Well, it, I guess it's mostly whether or not the, um, in terms of the outcome, the impetus is on just following through with what was submitted um, to, the, uh, to the sabbatical committee. So if you, if you meet your objective, yeah, I guess one way to put it is if you meet your objectives uh, with respect to your sabbatical proposal, do you guys care what else I do, <laughs> i.e. being linked up to a Fulbright? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I think that it's a little bit outside of our purview, so long as we, you know, you know the, the sort of checks for a sabbatical, I mean, it, it's sort of irrelevant whether it is supported right. by a Fulbright or not, if that is the answer to your question. And I, I do you. know that last time um, we had at least one sabbatical applicant who hadn't heard back from their Fulbright application yet. And so they also added a paragraph at the end of, well, this is how I'm going to, this is how I'm going to adjust my project if I don't get the Fulbright. So they wrote it as if they were going to get the Fulbright and then added a, a really detailed paragraph of, okay, this is exactly how I'm going to pivot if I don't get it. Okay. Um, and that was helpful for us. Okay, thank you. Fingers crossed, Bill. Yeah, I'm, if the due date for the thing is, you know, like three days from now, it's like writing a dissertation just to do the application. Yeah, I bet. Well, thanks to the committee for doing what you guys have done. We appreciate you putting this on. Sure. Happy, happy to help. Well, <laughs> like I said, you're welcome to ask me questions by email too. And, and I will forward them to the committee if I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I don't think you're required to keep us till the end of class. I'm not, but I don't want to, I also don't want to cut somebody off if they're, if they're like thinking of the question, it just hasn't quite come out yet. <laughs> Will we have access to this recording? Yeah, uh, Chris is recording it and uh, Chris, I don't, actually he had to leave. Um, so I don't remember I'm actually he's, still here. Oh, uh, you are still here. Sorry. Yeah, my son's, uh, they're canceling the soccer game, so. Because oh. of the storm, so yeah, we're good. Sure. Uh, this will be posted on two places. Uh, it will go onto our YouTube channel for the uh, Brown Center. Uh, since we already have one, it's easier for us to just put it on that one instead of on a PDC and creating a new one. Second is on the Faculty Engage. Um, some of you may have already been aware of this on our uh, blog page. Is where we put all of our recordings. Um, also, an explanation of what each. Um, excuse me. Uh, each of our webinars and uh, any type of workshop was that was recorded. Um, so just look for it there uh, and I will post that link right now for you all so that you have Do we it. access uh, 
this through the Stetson portal? Where where do we find? So I just I, I just posted our uh, link for the blog. Oh, we okay. are separate from the Stetson webpage. Uh, we have a um, I can't think of the, the word I'm looking for right now, but we have our own our own website, if you will. Okay. Uh, so and we run it through blog.stetson.edu slash Brown Center, uh, okay. as you see there. But uh, faculty engage, just to let you all know, is, is where we do all of our trainings, anything online, anything that's offline and in person goes on there. So if you're ever looking for any type of professional development like this or anything else, it will always be there. All right. Yeah. Any last thoughts? If not, then have a great weekend.